to Andrew. Is that what's on the WebEx? Yes. Perfect. All right. Sorry, I'll get the things so I can actually read my screen. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ed Rion. I'm at CND, and I want to talk a little bit about um, something slightly different, but still very much related, and that is containers. So, uh, before I start, just as a quick overview, I'm going to start to talk about, you know, where, how we got to where we are today, sort of some of the investigation that we've done with containers at Sandia, and then transition to what Todd was talking about, this new uh, ECP containers project, or super containers as I like to call it. So um, hopefully this will be a good overview for everybody if you're not already familiar with containers, um, if, if you're not quite sure what the, the point of these are and how this all fits in. So. Um, I'm hope, hoping this can be both introductory as well as, well, useful. So, all right, great, yep, DOE and the NNSA as well as Sandia has a long history um, sort of, you know, in HPC. This is of no surprise. And uh, many of our mission workloads really do require sort of this, this high scale. Um, within the NNSA, we have both capacity and capability computing, um, and, and really all this is on-premise, if you will. Um, and public cloud computing is often prohibitive for places like Sandia, not only just in terms of the security model, but also just the cost, which I'll explain a little bit in more detail with a quick slide. However, clouds are very famous for being incredibly flexible and can run whatever you want, right? Um, boy, wouldn't that be great if HPC was the same. So there's this new technology called containers. Um, and sort of we started asking ourselves these, these basic questions of, can we support containers in the context of HPC? And how will this model actually impact sort of our, our major application development and deployment? So, all right, what's a container? Well, you go to the mall and you go to the container store and you pick it. No, no, don't, don't do that. Uh, so a container is actually a unified bit of, um, you know, software. Think of everything that you need to run your given application or process packaged into a single entity, if, in, in this case being a container. Uh, of course, minus the operating system kernel, of course. So... Uh, this is actually based on OS virtualization, which is different than virtual machines, and that's an important distinction. Think of this as sort of, you know, CH root or change root on steroids, um, rather than, you know, running your entire VM, for instance. This uses uh, really cool kernel features uh, through, the, through the use of uh, namespaces, sometimes user namespace, mount, PID, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and many people are actually familiar with containers in the context of Docker. You've probably heard of or used Docker at this point on Amazon EC2. Maybe you've used it as part of the Google Cloud, heard of Kubernetes, these sort of things. So um, that's sort of everybody's first experience, I guess, with containers is Docker. And that's great. So we start really trying to create this vision here of, you know, supporting HPC software development and testing on your laptops, on your workstations that we have, that we all would like to do our builds from. Then from there, we should be able to take those containers and go and deploy them and run them on some of our fastest supercomputing, supercomputing facilities, um, really with the hope of minimizing that turnaround time between, you know, putting in a, a code change and actually deploying that and running that on our, on our systems. And this really gives a lot of flexibility to developers. You can specify exactly how you want your environment um, and how you build your application um, with as much or as little detail as you actually would like, right? Um, and then when it comes to actually running it, you just import the container or, or, you know, shift it to your HPC resource and go and run. Boy, that would be nice. We have to be careful. We have to manage, uh, you know, a, a wide array of different architectures, compilers, uh, various hardware, GPUs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and with HPC or the boutique nature of HPC, this can actually be a really significant challenge. Um, so and we have to do that without sacrificing performance. Containers are a form of abstraction. Like anything else, when you add abstraction, you have the potential 
or the ability really uh, the mandate to add overhead. So we need to make sure that that overhead is small and uh, does not actually impact the whole point of, what, of HPC, and that is sort of performance being paramount. And maybe this can also support some, some interesting uh, future uh, workflows and ensembles as well, focused on some of the latest AI machine learning efforts. Okay, so what are the cool features that we'd like with containers in HPC? Really, as I mentioned, it's sort of this BYOE. Let's bring our own environment. Let's define it. Let's, let's you know, uh, be able to leverage that. And then maybe not drag and drop, but, you know, essentially that same concept of being able to deploy your environment wherever you need to. And having this ability to, to compose um, your software stack port it to wherever you need to, and then being able to leverage some of the latest version control integration mechanisms that you find with Git, for instance. Um, things that we can't have with containers in HPC, as I mentioned, overhead, first and foremost, this is a non-starter. You know, if I, if I run a container and, and in order to support containers, I lose half of my performance, well, that's, that's not really going to work for, for DOE and NSA. So, uh, we're not really interested, at least yet, in supporting microservices. This is sort of the classical use case with containers. I've got a small microservice, which includes, you know, my, uh, my web server. I've got another container in my database backend, and I've got a load balancer in another container. I'm not really worried about that so much. I'm actually talking about putting entire HPC apps as a container and running many containers all starting up that MPI process, right? Um, and I'm not yet focused, but maybe this will change in the near future as we get into more in situ analytics workloads, but I'm not currently work worrying about on-node per partitioning. So with Docker, for instance, it leverages C groups, which allows you to, say, pack in a whole bunch of Docker containers on one host. In HPC, we actually do the exact opposite, right? We go and leverage tens, hundreds, thousands of, of nodes uh, for one application. This is a big sort of non-starter. We can't have root operation on these containers. In many ways, Docker equals root. And this is a fundamental problem for deploying on, you know, shared user facilities, right? And there's a lot of commodity networking stuff that um, is, is sort of uh, very much baked into um, the, the con container world within, the, you know, within clouds that we just, we just don't want, right? We don't, we don't really care about TCP IP usually. So as I sort of alluded to, Docker's not really a good fit for HPC workloads, so we've got to do something else. Um, you know, I can use Docker to build on my laptop, and I do often, um, but when it comes to actually running on HPC resources, we've got to do something different. So luckily, I'm not the only one to realize this, and several people figured it out actually before I did, um, and there are several different container runtimes specifically targeted for HPC. Uh, the three major ones that I'll mention today are Shifter, Singularity, and Charlie Cloud. There's actually, uh, you know, every week there's a new container runtime. You can write it in 56 lines of Go if you really want to be clever. Um, but these are sort of the container runtimes today, and they're all really useful. You can use every one of these. Um, they offer different design mechanisms, how they store and manage images, how they actually do um, namespace orientation under the hood, some of the security models, how you build images and some extra features along the way. So for Sandia, at least, we started looking at Singularity as this sort of best fit our current needs. It's open source, it's publicly available, and there's this new fancy startup company that backs it, which is kind of nice if I need to, uh, you know, if I have a problem and I need to bug somebody about how to fix all this. Um, they have their own uh, image support, but I can also run Docker containers all the same, which is a really powerful notion. Um, and it supports multiple architectures. In fact, we've actually deployed it on uh, the Astra system, here, uh, you know, quickly pictured here, which is a, an ARM uh, Thunder X2 uh, uh, system that we've, we've recently built. And we deployed it across our, uh, you know, CTS1 and TLCC clusters as well. Um, so, so this is really nice. And, and there's also GPU support, um, at least initially, uh, for NVIDIA GPUs. So, all right, this model starts to quickly emerge here. This, uh, this idea that I can, I can do sort of some basic DevOps on my laptops, build my container image with my, my software stack that I need, push this to a container registry service, whether that's Docker Hub, whether that's within GitLab, et cetera, and then deploy it to multiple different facilities, whether that's Amazon EC2, whether that's my, my CTS cluster, cluster, commodity cluster, or something more uh, specialized like a Cray. So just to give you a quick example, I think Todd showed this really quickly and even, even cleaner than this, but this is just a first example of 
somebody's uh, uh, container build with, uh, you know, building Trilinos for, for Mulu. And really here we can see the power of, power of building containers. I just say from my dev TPL container. This is already a container that I have that I've built all these third-party libraries or TPLs in. And there I just go and manually install Trilinos. Now you could also imagine you could do the exact same thing using SPAC, right? Um, and Todd showed a great example of that. But this is sort of what we talk about when we, when we talk about building containers. So um, we, we took this notion, we decided to, to do a series of experiments uh, that I think are really, really interesting. So we built a series of benchmarks um, and mini apps that we have into a container image or, or actually two container images. And we said, hey, can we run the same exact container image both on Amazon EC2 and a testbed system that we have that's actually a Cray. So um, this is sort of a, a quick experiment that we did. And then sort of what are the implications of this both in terms of performance and, and usability? So this is sort of this tale of two systems, if you will, where we have Volta, which is basically Cray XC30 using Ivy Bridge. Uh, I think this is very similar to Edison, if you will. Uh, at, at NERSC, um, and, then, and then we matched that as close as we possibly could with uh, C3 images with Amazon EC2 to try. This isn't an apples to apples comparison, but we, we did the best we could. And you know, we, you know this cost $176, hour, uh, $176 an hour, um, which sounds really cheap until you realize that that's over a million dollars a year if you run this continuously. So actually about one and a half million dollars. My little Cray test bed did not cost me that. So um, let's look at performance here. So this is running HPCG, a uh, very classic benchmark that is very useful for representing uh, things that we care about for our mission applications. Um, and we see that you know, if I use Singularity and, and I link in Cray's MPI over MPitch in my container, I get 99.8% of the performance. Boy, that's really nice, scaling out. Um, I can do certain things that can really hinder my, my performance um, if I use the regular built, you know, Intel MPI that's in the container, I see my, my performance drop off. And this is just because Intel MPI doesn't know how to use the Eugenie libraries to drive the Aries interconnect in, on my Cray system. And then comparing this to the, the, uh, the other line here with Docker, we see those Docker, those Docker uh, sorry, with AWS using Docker, uh, these images are actually, or instances are slightly faster than my Cray on a per node basis, but uh, scalability quickly falls off the cliff as I, as I scale up. Um, and HPCG isn't exactly as very sensitive to network performance. So even just at a small scale, we see this, we, we see performance dropping off to 72%. Um, I'll probably skip this other, other than to just simply say that we're, we can use um, some of these container mechanisms um, for, for air gap networks. So what, what are the takeaways or uh, the Tupperware, if you will? For, for containers. Um, we quickly learned that, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you like that talk. Um, you, you should use Docker to build your container images. You can use these manifests and assemble an entire application suite if you want to. Um, you should really, uh, you know, uh, use Docker in this case and then import it into Singularity. And this really gives a lot of flexibility for our application de developers. It simplifies the deployment for, for analysts uh, and it's easy to get new developers spun up instead of giving them a instructions. Here's what it takes to build Trilinos and then them spending what? What was the estimate yesterday? Like a week to go and figure out how to properly build Trilinos. I can just hand them my Docker container and say, here you go. Now you can make code modifications and go from there. Um, and there's this, I would say, hope or new hope of reproducibility, although this is yet to, you know, time will tell whether or not that, that, that pans out. There's some caveats with using, using containers in this model with HPC. And the first and foremost is ABI compatibility issues with MPI. So really what we're doing to get all this, this performance or, or near native performance is linking in my system MPI on the host. In this case, you know, what I, what I demonstrated with Cray, Cray's MPI over MPitch because MPitch and Cray's MPI are ABI compatible. That's a really nice feature. However, if Cray goes and changes that ABI compatibility, all this kind of goes out the window quickly, right? Um, and we need to do a little more work for actually supporting alternative architectures. The other, the other thing to realize here, and, and Todd alluded to this, you know, containers are a nice option for HPC. In no way is this a mandate. You can still build software the, and, and deploy software on HPC systems 
the, the exact same way that you've done for the past 20 years, right? This is just a new option. So, so with that, we quickly started to uh, transition to this new uh, super container project, which is a you know, joint effort across several labs and the University of Oregon. Um, and really what we're trying to do is take this to the next step. We really want to make sure that um, container runtimes are going to be scalable. We can do this in an inter interoperable way, and they are well integrated and supported across the ECP facilities. Um, and really what we're trying to do is deliver on this promise that you can take a container image from your laptop and deploy it and run it at Exascale. Um, and there's a whole lot of work that we need to do sort of under the hood to clean up this mess. Um, which is the current situation with containers in many ways. Um, there's some initial scalability studies that we need to do. There's a lot of R&D effort that we have to do. We're collaborating with various uh, ECP projects, both in the software technology and application spaces, and there's a lot of training in which we can do to help people build, you know, correct container images for HPC. Um, this is not to say that we're gonna pick a container runtime to be the be all end all, whether it's Charlie Cloud or Singularity, the idea is individual sites should make that decision. We wanna be able to support containers across any container runtime that's, that's deployed. Um, so from an R&D perspective, there are certain things that we really wanna do and, and really the, the simple story is these things must work at exascale. So there's, there's an efficient you know, effort or there's an effort to focus on efficient container launch at scale and doing some initial comparison studies that I'm kicking off soon. Really, we're also trying to develop optimized images, working with Samir on uh, creating, you know, uh, optimized D4S image and using SPAC in a container um, and using some of the new features that, that Todd and his team have been putting together in SPAC. And also trying to leverage vendor images. You know, I, I feel like, um, it's a matter of time before Cray hands me a base container image that I can then go and use and uh, improve upon and hand that to my developer to develop using the, the Cray PE, for instance. Um, we have this big focus on expanding interoperability. I, I don't want to be so dependent or, or, or praying, if you will, that, that you know, various MPI implementations don't randomly break ABI compatibility. I'd like to see this be uh, a stronger focus for us, um, where we're less reliant on, on other people in this regard. And there's a lot of standards in which we want to support. Yes? So, how are you planning to um, like enforce that or get the DAP compatibility? So, let me tell you how I'd like to see it. Um, I'd actually not have to, re I'd like to not have to rely on, on MPI itself's ABI compatibility lever layer. The idea is I'd like to see us depend on a lower level library beneath MPI, whether that's libfabric, whether that's UCX, I'm not sure, but there should be one layer there. So it doesn't matter what your MPI implementation it is, is so long as I can swap in a lower level, uh, you know, uh, fab fabric framework, maybe this is lib, you know, libfabric for instance, and I can swap that in and out. So libfabric may be optimized for your particular machine. I don't have to worry about how you built MPI. I just have to link in your libfabric underneath that. That would be really nice. I don't think we're there yet. I'm trying really hard to drive this with, with the larger community, but go ahead, Todd. So it's appealing to imagine that there would be a lower level library with a stable API that you could rely on for high performance. That, that's true. I guess I, how do you, it seems like that's really just a maintenance question, right? Like someone would have to maintain that library. And ideally it would be kind of the MPI implementers and the vendors in collaboration. This, this takes a lot of effort yeah. from, from multiple vendors, right? Not just one. So yeah. well, um, ideally the MPIs would also just use it normally, but they don't all right now. And yeah. So like, yep. do you anticipate, I mean, I don't know, I, I guess, what, if, if we move towards this, how long do you think that a libfabric implementation would be on par performance-wise with another? I think it depends on which vendor you pick, okay. right? So, so I would say if you pick vendor A, that should be available already, okay. uh, or or very very soon. If you pick a different vendor, that may be a different story. Uh, I think that the quickest way to drive some of this home is going to be through the procurement hammers in which we we may wield both at the NSF and DOE. Okay. Uh, if if you really want to help out with this, saying hey, I need to whatever next supercomputer I buy, I, I need to have a, a, a you know, compatible libfabric framework um, that I think would go a long way. But we can do more along, you know, 
um, along the way and working directly with vendor communities. And I'm not even sure Live Fabric's the right answer. I just think we need something lower than MPI. For instance, this may also support you know, non-MPI based workloads, AMTs, et cetera, et cetera, that could actually then depend on that lower level API as well. So um, it should be more flexible than just MPI. That's my hope. There's, there's a whole lot of work that we need to do with, with MPI and the vendor communities to, to try to make this happen. But um, we're, we're hoping to start that conversation, right? Yeah. So, and there's plenty of other opportunities here that we can do uh, in the context of R&D. You know, it'd be really nice to support this complex workflow ensembles that we're really seeing take shape uh, across the DOE with, with it, with a lot of our computation being more than just um, classical modeling and simulation. There's, there's analytics components and there's analysis components and ML components that are all sort of going into this wider workflow ensemble. We should be able to support that with, to, with some notion with containers. And this also includes, you know, maybe supporting some of those uh, service containers that, that I alluded to earlier, right? What if I do have a, a, a Jupyter notebook that I'd like to have connect to my HPC, HPC simulation? There should be a mechanism that we can put in place to support this. So, and do we still have any hope of reproducibility? I think that's an open question. So I mentioned also application support. Uh, really what we're trying to do is work with various ST and, e and application uh, teams to really advise and support some of the first container uh, models uh, moving forward with Exascale here. Um, this is going to take a series of deep dive sessions with various app teams, uh, provide, you know, getting them to use the base images that, that maybe we provide, enabling them to use SPAC in the container, develop their own sort of SPAC environment based on their needs, their application needs, and then uh, trying to tune and support this actually on the deployment side. Uh, with facilities. And, you know, I'll, I'll quickly uh, uh, hint at sort of my view of how I'd like to see some of the CI workflow uh, work with this as well. So one of the first use cases that we've seen is with Nalu. Um, this is a simple performance study on a small set of nodes with Nalu. Nalu is a generalized unstructured, uh, basically low mock CFD code as part of the uh, ExaWin project. Um, but it does, as Todd uh, mentioned yesterday, have a fairly complex um, you know, set of third part uh, TPL requirements and a fairly, you know, robust uh, software toolkit here. And so we built a container both outside, you know, natively as you would normally, and we uh, gave some of these features to our, our Nalu developers and said, here, build me a containerized version of Nalu, and we ran them on the exact same resource. And we actually found that our container ran slightly faster. Uh, this is not a mistake. Well, it is a mistake. But um, it's actually a, a, an interesting thing to find because it shows both the power and the pitfalls of containers. What actually happened is they ended up using a slightly more optimized version of their MPI library, um, which used a little more memory but ran slightly faster at higher scale. Um, and that sort of goes to drive home the notion that if you want that flexibility of your software stack, you, you have it. You can, you can build, you can use the latest cutting edge, um, you know, TPLs or the latest advancements to, you know, to build and run your, your uh, application. Uh, you're not tied to potentially uh, whatever, whatever happens to be on that HPC resource at, the, at, the, at that point in time. That being said, you're kind of on your own to some extent too. If you screw this up, you are your own support mechanism to some extent, and that does have some dangers to it. So um, I think that was an interesting finding. Another one that we've been working with recently is a Sandia sort of mission app for, as part of ATDM called Spark. Um, this is more HIMOX CFD, if you will. And uh, this is a really boring graph, so I, I introduced an interesting picture of a generic reentry vehicle. But essentially, these lines are near, it makes no different, identical. This is running Spark, both in a container and native. And if you notice, these bars match up pretty closely, and uh, they're, they're within an error um, of one another. So all right, we've che we're checking off a lot of boxes in terms of initial performance. My container supporting this application runs just as fast as outside the container, and that's a really nice thing. And this is actually using the, the HiFlyer high 1 experiment, which is a pretty small experiment, which looks different than that generic reentry vehicle. It's a, yeah. Um, the other thing that we're starting to really see more demand for is supporting uh, sort of these deep learning frameworks and, and ML uh, tools within our traditional HPC. I'm sure we're not alone in this, and, and other people have really been focused on this. So, 
We're working with an AD team right now uh, to, to build a custom uh, PyTorch container that, that it can be run. Well, really, we're building two container images. One is for our Astra system to be able to run and support PyTorch on our, on our ARM Astra system, as well as to leverage uh, a CTS machine with GPUs. Um, but the idea here is that we can borrow from sort of the cloud world when that makes sense, be able to take these container images from, you know, that are, that are available online, already built using PyTorch, make sure they're efficient at using, say, the NVIDIA GPUs or, 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 or recompile properly to take advantage of the optimizations with the Thunder X2 ARM chip and be able to deploy these at scale. Um, and, and many of these tools are also available within the E4S uh, framework that, that Samir is going to talk about. And then I'm sort of going to kind of quickly pitch here this idea of a containerized CI, CI pipeline. Really, the idea is I'd like to generate uh, container builds from a pull request or, or a commit or something of that sort that really then can be deployed on HPC systems. So this may start out initially as a pull request to a Git repo, which triggers a, a mechanism where I'll go and deploy and build a, a, you know, start a Docker build, if you will, that goes and builds my container with that pull request, being able to pull in SPAC packages along the way if, you, if you're using SPAC, um, maybe using SPAC binary mirrors that Todd's, Todd's working on and has mentioned to, or, or doing it you know, natively, if you will, um, and uh, being able to then run some basic tests on this. And we should be able to do this for multiple different architectures. Maybe the small, this heterogeneous build farm actually resembles a couple of nodes of each of our sort of up and coming uh, supercomputing facilities, whether that's A21 or Sierra or Astra or what have you. And then being able to take these containers, you know, import them into Singularity and go run them, either on, um, you know, the next generation Cray machine or our CTS, our, our commodity clusters that we have today. So um, this is admittedly still slide where there's a whole lot of uh, plumbing and work that we have to do, but this is sort of the vision that I'm hoping to, to take shape here over the next couple of months and, and year or so. Um, and all this is really to say that we have to continue to focus on education and training. Containers are, are, are different. This is a whole new software deployment methodology. And so we really need to focus on how we support our users. Um, this is gonna be done through a series of efforts. First, we're gonna put out some technical reports over the next couple of months and years. You'll see a best practices document from us uh, relatively soon, as well as hopefully a sort of survey paper, if you will. Um, really sort of explaining the state of the practice uh, when it comes to containers and HPC. We're also running training sessions, uh, and Samir's been helping uh, a good deal with this. And uh, we, we ran our first demo at ISC. We will be having a uh, half-day tutorial session on containers and HPC at Supercomputing, as well as our, our next ECP all-hands meeting, presumably. Um, and really what we're trying to provide is sort of a source of knowledge for groups that are interested in working with containers, and, and SPAC as well, hopefully. Um, none of this is done. Um, we still have a whole lot to do. I think we've demonstrated some initial value with container and the containerization model for HPC. I think we've shown that we can run this at near native uh, if, if we're careful, if we implement our best practices, but there's a lot more that we can do to support this and really bring this into full production. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do with this new super containers effort that we started a couple of months ago. You're going to take away one thing. Uh, do remember that you know um, the whole idea with containers here is to increase uh, software diversity and flexibility within HPC. I'm not looking to turn my HPC system into a cloud, mind you, but I'd like to be able to provide some more uh, flexible tools and, and flexibility to our developers when and where possible. So, and none of this is done in a vacuum. I have a whole uh, large team of collaborators and, and help along the way, uh, some of which are in this room. So. Uh, with that, I think I'll end and also mention we have a, a new workshop that we're starting up. Uh, Shane Cannon from NERSC and myself are kicking off this uh, Canopy HPC workshop, which is sort of a dedicated workshop at Supercomputing focused on, on containers and, and new orchestration paradigms. So if you're already using containers at your site and you've got this really cool demonstration or you've, you've tweaked a runtime to... to to do something else really cool. We'd love to hear about it. Feel free to uh, submit a, a paper. Uh, you still got, you know, a good month and a half, uh, two months, if you will. We may or may not be able to push that deadline back. We're, of course, uh, taking both full papers and short papers. So if it's uh, an initial work in progress, we'd still love to hear from you. We'd still really like to see that. So.
Um, with that, I think I'll end and take any questions. So, and we're like everybody else, we're hiring. I need a lot of help here. So, if you're interested in container builds, come come talk to me. Or if you have if you have a you know a student who's looking for a job soon, definitely. So, all right, questions. Who's actually? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna quiz you guys for a quick second, if nobody minds. Who's actually used and built the container before? Excellent. All right. Who's actually deployed a container? at scale on your HPC resource. Yes, that is, that is exactly what we're hoping to fix here, um, is try to really bring this stuff home. Um, these, are, these are fun things to play with, but um, you know, there's a lot of work that we need to do to actually bring this into production. So um, that's really good. Has, who's actually like run Singularity or Charlie Cloud or Shifter? Okay, so we've got, we've got several people here. So all right, you're starting to realize that you can't run Docker on, on your, your HPC cluster your supercomputer. We can run Docker. Yeah? I hope you don't. Can't run Docker. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, okay, that's exactly right. Yeah. You do not want, uh, you know, you, the idea here is you should be able to do builds as root or however you want to on your machine. But, you know, I don't want to go be mounting my Lustre file system with people having root access on their container, right? Bad things can happen quickly. So, um, and a lot of these container work, uh, run times, are really useful for, for just alleviating that problem, if you will. So, all right, any other questions? Or <coughs> I leave you guys alone? Awesome. And please come join us for uh, at SC for, for both the workshop and the tutorial. So, I think uh, Dave is up. Yep. I'm going to stop presenting.